The Ryan Tuberty Show on RTE Radio 1, sponsored by Sky Broadband. With our broadband, your world is limitless. Live beyond. 9.29 this Tuesday morning. Always good to have you with us. 51551 is the text number. I often uh, refer to the internet as being like the Wild West with no sheriff, a lawless place <laughs> where anyone can say or do anything. Uh, unfortunately, it's still, for the large part, it can often be a cesspit. But Ian Urbina is an investigative journalist with the New York Times who has spent five years reporting, not the internet, but actually another fairly... Um, lawless place at the best of times which is the ocean the seas it's called the outlaw ocean the name of a book he's written on the basis of his uh, investigations and he joins us this morning Ian nice to talk to you thank you for joining us thank you for having me of all the places in all the world how did you alight upon the sea as a, as a subject of your studies I was interested in the sea since I was a little boy and uh, I was uh, doing doctoral work on uh, cultural anthropology uh, and um, took some time off and went and worked on a ship in Singapore and it sort of opened my eyes to what a bizarre and fascinating place um, this was uh, and um, quite especially the um, the people who work on these ships um, just sort of dazzled me. I can understand why, because they, it, it's oftentimes it reads like something out of another era. The sea has a kind of timeless quality to it in terms of the language, uh, the behaviour, the etiquette. Yeah, in a funny way, I, I felt like this this to, to venture out into this space, into the world of these people was um, one part time travel and one part space travel. You mm. know, in in the sense that um, you're essentially getting on a spaceship. You know, this this ship, and uh, you're heading beyond the horizon into a realm where uh, the laws of time and the laws of physics um, aren't quite like they are for us landlubbers. Um, not to mention sort of the culture um, on these vessels, the hierarchy, the uh, um, the sort of code of conduct, um, all very different. Um, and time really does get bent uh, when you're out there and you're working for nine, 12 months. Um, and just the physical reality of the space, it's so sprawling and and Mother Nature sort of has, has her wrath um, to a degree that um, I'd never experienced on land. Well, I suppose it's probably worth mentioning the Mary Liberium um, and, and put that into context, what that is. Yeah, so Mara Liberum is uh, this notion that um, uh, freedom of the seas and, and um, it, it is simply at its core the idea that um, uh, the seas are, are, are free and, and, and um, be they ship operators or companies or individuals are allowed to pass through that space uh, unfettered by governments. Um, and it, this is the spirit of, of the law that um, applies on the high seas, so outside of national waters, uh, international waters and sort of the direct jurisdictional uh, limits that are put on it. Okay, well, let, let's hit the hit the water then and uh, talk about some of the extraordinary things you see, including again an old-fashioned expression, but the bandit ship. What 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 are they? And and you talk about in in chapter one this uh, storming the thunder. Could you take us through that? Yeah. So the 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 chase of the thunder was this epic uh, story that somewhat landed in my lap. Um, this was a story of a ship called the Thunder that. Um, had been engaged in illegal fishing for over a decade, um, specifically and especially down in Antarctica, um, in those waters in the Southern Ocean, uh, and uh, primarily fishing for toothfish, which on our menus might be called Chilean sea bass. Uh, and this ship um, had been illegally fishing down there um, and had racked up sort of a um, a tab, an illicit tab of over $60 million, and no one seemed willing or able to bring it to justice. And so this vigilante conservation group, Sea Shepherd, decided they wanted to do something about it. Um, this organization has a fleet of ships of its own, and they said, look, we're going to show the world and to some degree shame um, developed world countries and their governments um, by proving that these guys can be caught and so and can be found in the first place. Um, Interpol had ranked um, the Thunder as sort of the world's most wanted ship, and it was an arrest on site, purple notice on it. 
Uh, so Sea Shepherd went out, found these guys, and then for the next 110 days chased the thunder uh, from Antarctica to the coast of Africa, where um, ultimately the officers and the captain of the thunder sunk their own ship so as to... Um, uh, destroy the evidence that might lead to their prosecution. And you, you meet these these people uh, on the the high seas, and the characters you come across, like like the Bates family, Roy and Michael Bates, who you know you you couldn't write them really, could you? You'd have to you'd have to meet them. That's quite right. Yeah, I mean, sometimes the characters were so colorful, as as you mentioned, the Bates, a perfect example. Um, that I wondered whether people would believe me. Um, uh, but the Bates family uh, were um, uh, these um, uh, two men that decided they wanted to uh, create their own micronation, their own principality. And um, uh, Roy Bates uh, knew about this gunnery platform um, off the coast of England um, that was at the time in international waters. Um, it's now located in national waters because the line has shifted. But uh, being in international waters uh, and having been sort of an abandoned platform that was used to um, uh, during the Second World War, um, Mr. Bates thought, well, I'm going to take over that platform and claim it as my own because it doesn't really belong to anyone at this point. Uh, and that began this long kind of crazy history of what some call the smallest micronation on planet Earth, sea land. Um, it has its own customs, its own passport, um, and it's really only the size of about three tennis courts. Um, and uh, there have been, you know, the U U.S. Uh, um, British government attempted to take over it at one point. And um, so that chapter, uh, then that story was just meant to show the kind of diversity of um, outlaw um, activity and characters that are out there. Did you find when you're when you're spending time out on on the sea, did you find it to be uh, lonely? Or did it bring its own kind of, uh, kind of, if you could have it, such a thing, a solitary company? Uh, does that make sense at all? But, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the Mother Nature being on your side? Yeah, it's, it's funny you tap into that. I mean, the, the, there was, I didn't intend to have a psychological kind of through line to this book, but um, the more time I spent on there, on these ships, and with these people, the more I became fascinated by, you know, kind of the stereotype of the curmudgeonly captain and what that was about, and, and also just the role that silence and... Um, and sort of loneliness plays uh, out there on these people that work this life. There are, you know, 50 million people that work at sea. And um, I, I do think it's it's a, a really um, addictive and, and alluring um, openness that that is out there, both geographically and just also in terms of the lifestyle, mm. um, div divorced from the expectations of governments and laws and family uh, on land. Um, I also think it's dangerously... Uh, lonely, as you say, and, and to some degree almost akin to um, solitary confinement. And I did find that um, some of those who come back to shore, uh, having worked this uh, uh, type of work for a long time, had a real difficult time readjusting, myself included, uh, almost a PTSD that you might yeah. think of soldiers having. And and when you were recovering from that, what was it? Was it just the noise of people, the people and places and sounds? Yeah, it's it's the level of interaction. You get home. I have kids and a spouse, and and just sort of the the speed of daily life and the amount of information that's coming in at mm. you at all times. Mm. Um, it's also just your sense of space is very different. Um, you know, I found myself accustomed to sleeping in extremely small quarters, you know, coffin-like um, bunks on on these ships, and then when I got home, this huge bed um, <laughs> just felt weirdly agoraphobic. Um, uh, and it's just, uh, yeah, it's, it's, um, the, the bustle of, of life and, and, um, uh, the, the emotional complexity of life on land, um, is, is different than what you experience on and, a ship. And did you have a, cl a class of maritime Stockholm syndrome? Did you, did you f kind of fall <laughs> in love with life and the sea, even though you mightn't have loved it as much as you, you know, you loved it too yeah. much? Do you know what I'm saying? No, I do quite. Yeah. I mean, I think, you, you know, you, this, it's a bit stereotypic, but in these prison movies, you know, you always have that element of the prisoner who sort of seems to want to go back to yes. his cell. And, and, and I do feel 
feel like these these ships are are prison cells to some degree, but in an odd way, um, it's home. And um, and there's so much beautiful out there and alluring and incredible. And the camaraderie um, of of life on these ships is alluring too. But um, yeah, I, I do think that. Um, uh, I found myself becoming more comfortable in that space. What did you find any of the superstitions to be particularly bonkers? Um, yeah, you, the, for some reason, the the whole whistling thing—you know—you're not ever supposed to whistle on what? board, and and people take it. And I, I never really—I'm sure one of your listeners will will immediately know what the etymology of that is, but I I, I didn't ever find out why you're not supposed to whistle, but. Um, uh, uh, I just found that really strange, and the, a couple of times when I tested the limits, I, I was quickly informed that that was not a joking matter. And that's whistling, as in, as opposed to right. using a whistle in your hand, like a yeah. That's, <laughs> right. There's a yeah. difference between you know, because you know, in Star Trek, when they in I know it's a different type of ship, but it's still they use the language of of the nautical world, and that's they'll right. be talking about the you know that sort of whistle that's that you right. might hear. That's right. Is, so is that bad luck, or where did that come from? I wonder. I I don't know. I think whistling with your mouth is its own distinct thing. I think the the whistle on Star Trek I always thought was uh, coming from one of the machines. But but yeah, I don't I don't. I oh don't yeah, know. you know you're. I have no doubt. But I I think probably from once upon a time there must be. Anyway, I don't know. Let's move on. I've I've taken us into the stars, and that's not where we're meant to be today. We're meant to be on the high seas. Let's go back to the sea, and tell me in about because I I did find it intriguing. To how do you deal with vagabonds and thieves and so on? On a boat, and you challenge you 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 sort this out with us. Um, answer this first on chapters in chapter six about jail without bars. Could you can you touch, talk us through what what you do what they do, mm. the rafting? Yeah, so I think w- one of the chapters, I, you know, th- it, through time the sea has been um, this metaphor for for escape, you know, for freedom, the ultimate form of freedom, mm. and um, and I think that uh, is true. Um, uh, and has driven a lot of people to head there. At the same time, I found um, uh, an escape for some, a prison for others, and I wanted to look at the various ways in which people get trapped out there. And so uh, in that chapter, I was looking at um, different examples. So number one, I looked at um, the extent to which, for example, in the post-9-11 era, um, the U.S. government and others had resorted to using the extra legal nature of the high seas and the space out there and the remove from lawyers and journalists and the like um, and taken advantage of that to detain uh, terrorism suspects and engage in methods of interrogation you might call torture um, that they couldn't get away with on land. That was one category I looked at. Another was um, stowaways, you know, these sort of... um, hobos of the sea that were aiming to that are aiming to travel from a to b and um, mean to pass through the sea across it um, uh, many of them get stuck um, on board and i looked at one story in particular a dramatic story of two tanzanian stowaways um, that boarded a ship in cape town um, and were discovered while at sea and brought up um, on deck and then put on a raft uh, a man you know sort of a makeshift raft and cut free um, and the ship left them there and these two guys didn't know how to swim and they were on essentially a tabletop with some oil drums beneath them and sort of their epic struggle to stay alive and stay on top and uh, they eventually washed up on shore in Liberia one of them died the other lived and was able to track that guy down actually right near the same port uh, trying to stow away again uh, in a shanty town and just sort of capture his story of what it was like uh, being abandoned out there and that's not an unusual rafting as that's called mm-hmm. is not an unusual way um, that stowaways get handled if you're not going to kill them um, directly then you're going to sort of set them free if you will in that fashion I mean it's just a whole other uh, world order isn't it and and this comes to um to pass then when you talk about also the transip, transshipment ships in page, uh, sorry, in chapter 10, mm-hmm. uh, where th- these are extraordinary ships that, fishing ships, they're very far out at sea and never come into port. Is that right? 
Yeah, that's right. So, you know, there's been this global crisis. This is where environmental concerns intersect with human rights concerns. Yes. So because of overfishing near shore, there f- there's a lot less fish to be caught near the coast. And so ships have to go much further away to catch a bare minimum to break even. And that gave rise to this method of, of fishing in which the fishing boats just stay out there indefinitely, sometimes for years, and they keep fishing continuously rather than come all the way back to shore. So in some cases, you have Thai ships off the coast to Somalia, for example, and they'll stay fishing. And then mother ships uh, will come out, bring ice and men and fuel and food and whatever, uh, parts, and then they bring the fish back to shore. And those transshipment vessels, those fish ships that stay out, um, are really... Uh, unusually brutal places and they often are you know they're prone to using migrant um, captive labor uh, and so I wanted to to get on board those and and chronicle um, life and work on them. Would you tell us that one of them uh, your stories about the, the Thai officers and how how that worked in terms of being shanghaied and trafficked so sea slavery is this term that sort of, in my mind, refers to a spectrum. Um, on one end of the spectrum, you have um, workers, um, migrants mostly, that are being um, literally kidnapped, right? Mm. Um, and on the other end of the spectrum, and I'll come back to this, you have um, softer forms of trafficking, uh, trafficking no, in some ways no less brutal, but more subtle. And those are that's debt bondage, right? So in the two models on that spectrum, imagine Thailand, middle-class country, less than two percent unemployment you know ties are not taking the the, the worst of jobs mm. the women are not in the sex industry uh, mostly and the men are not on the fishing boats these are migrant workers from nearby very poor violence prone um, war-torn countries laos cambodia myanmar and so migrants uh, flow in illegally across the border desperate for jobs they take these awful jobs and some of them are shanghai so you know a cambodian guy might be at a bar um, a ship captain at port and he is short two men. He's got to get out of slip within 24 hours and he needs some workers fast. He talks to the right guy. That right guy knows a brothel owner. That brothel owner drugs a guy. Guy passes out. Next thing he knows, he's awake on a ship. He's a Cambodian guy that just got shanghai and he'll be at sea for a year. Good you know? Lord. Um, and and he, he just wakes up and having been in one position, excuse the impression, one, one minute and then the next thing he's on the boat. That's right. Good yeah, I mean, it's really, it's something, you, it, it's hard to even believe when you hear these stories, but I heard them enough times to believe yeah. them. Okay, and they, they're, they're stuck on that boat then as es- essentially slaves? Yeah, I mean, so in in the case that we that we focused on initially in the in the piece that ran on the front page of the Times, there was one such guy, a Cambodian guy, and and he um, was debt bonded into uh, this job and ended up on a ship and off they went. And when he um, tried to escape, he jumped overboard and tried to swim to a mother ship that had come to resupply. Um, he was caught, brought back on board, and for the rest of the year that he was on that ship before he was sold to another, he was shackled by the neck at any time when he was not working. Cool. And, um, you know, that story we put on the front page um, and um, uh, it's part of what got a lot of attention on on this whole problem. In part of your series for the New York Times. And I presume if you're a a, a sailor or you're stuck on a ship as a slave or in some class of human traffic, you you see the Stella Maris charity emerging, the Star of the Sea, uh, to to come and help you. These are pretty important uh, people if you're in trouble on the high seas. Yeah, the, so there's this really inspiring um, sort of underground railroad of advocates who, like you say, Stella Maris is one um, such. Mission to Seafarers is another mm. uh, that are based in ports. They're often very small, underfunded outfits, and their their duty is to to look out for fishers and seafarers, and often co- they're they're in, intervening when either these guys are, and it's mostly a male world, are um, sort of abandoned on a ship, and and um, the ship is just stuck there, and the owner of the ship has sort of disappeared to the wind, and these guys don't know what to do. They can't get off and come to land, or in these more acute settings, uh, mostly in the developing world context, where deckhands are 
um, essentially see slaves, and when they see a chance to escape, they jump off the ship, swim to shore, and run away. And that's when these organizations, these human rights groups, intervene and try to help them escape. And meanwhile, they're in a foot race against the you know um, the bounty hunters that work for the the port and the ship captains, and they're looking to find the guys and bring them back to the ship as quickly as possible. Um, Ian, there's an there's enormous amount of people texting into the programme to give us the rundown on the whistling and the wind. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> so, I as much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I put that on you for opening. I, I will accept all uh, <laughs> accusations of of, uh, of starting such a, a peculiar conversation. But but you wrote the book. <laughs> uh, I should I have known. I should no, have known. Okay. That's fair point. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, I'll accept all responsibility. Anyway, Miles is in Doolit. We're an island nation, as you know, Ian. So we're, we're, yes. there's a lot of interest in this subject. Yeah. Uh, 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 Miles says that whistling on a ship summons the wind. Now a lot of people are saying the same thing. Whistling at sea is bad luck. Says Trevor in Donegal. In maritime folklore, it's said to challenge the wind itself and can bring about a storm. Oh, and uh, another says in olden days, sta- sailing ships used to whistle up a wind. So whistling brings the wind. Now, my question is then, do you want the wind if it's a calm day and you want wind in the sails? Or is it, I think more people are suggesting it's a challenge to the wind that the wind gets annoyed with you whistling at it. I'm not sure. Tempting fate. Yeah. Tempting fate. Um, Linda says to whistle on a boat is to call up the wind. On a sailboat, this could be hazardous. The whistle on Star Trek, oh great, she's covering all acts, uh, is a copy of the bosun's whistle, which meant officer mm-hmm. on board. Board. Ah, right, so when Picard mm-hmm. or Kirk, whoever you're watching, comes on board, that's the noise. Regarding fishermen's pishogs, the whistles, while on trawlers, uh, Kevin Carroll Carrigline says, whistle for rain, hum for fog, never marry a woman who looks like a dog. I mean, you cannot. <laughs> Obviously, this is going back to the last century. I'll, I'm going to throw that completely on Kevin Carroll before we're... Frog marched out of the off the <laughs> island by by the usual. Uh, right back in the last century. Tell well, it goes on and on and on. So now we know what the whistling situation is, Ian. That's that's the, 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 there's a whole book in that, I suspect. But isn't it funny how? Um, I always feel when I'm ever out in the sea, because I love going out in the sea, and whether it's fishing for mackerel on a little boat or just going to an island or whatever. It, it the, the, you know the word that. Good, the good people of America uh, kind of adopted and, and overuse, which is awesome. <laughs> and you know they said, my coffee is awesome. It's not. It's just coffee <laughs> and it's tasty and it's hot. But the sea is awesome. <laughs> Do you, is. you saw that awe. Oh. Yeah, with awe, I presume. You know where I'm I going did. with this. Dude. It was it was it was an awesome experience. Correct. In the correct awe, context. Awe, exactly. It was a, it is an awe inspiring place. You and, know, and, yeah. yeah, and and but what I'm saying is that it almost feels if the if the sea and we as humans and the land were all characters in a play, the sea has its role, yeah, and it should be respected. That's right. That's right. Yeah, I think, uh, and and those who don't spend time out there, I don't. And and I think also, um, it's one thing to to visit with um, uh, the sea. It's another thing to actually cross it. Um, and the longer you spend out there, the the more intense the. Um, sense of respect you have for it. Um, I'm speaking in platitudes now, but but I, I do think that um, uh, time plus that space um, is what I under I, I did not imagine um, would affect me as much as uh, just visiting the space for short stints. I can well imagine. Um, Ian, your book is called The Outlaw Ocean, Crime and Survival in the Last Untamed Frontier. Uh, intriguing uh, insight into such a vast and awesome phenomenon. Um, it's been good to talk to you. Thank you for your time this morning. Awesome, thank awesome. you. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I can't accept that, but I appreciate your time nonetheless. Cheers. Uh, and we've got to get some music now because Beezer from Inna Shannon says, back in the last century, myself and another lad were singing, sitting on the dock of, of the bay, of a bay, with uh, obviously the Otis Redding beautiful song on the Asgard. And we got to the whistling part and the captain came up from his cabin with a serious face in him and gave us a right rollicking and he told us, stop whistling as we could whistle up a storm.